and you can go ahead. Uh, welcome everybody to our uh, event today, which is going to be a just a terrific uh, education in the lives of two fantastic women who uh, really changed, really changed our country. Um, I'm Eleanor Swift. I'm the president of the Women's Faculty Club. And so I'm very, very pleased to welcome you even to this virtual uh, event. We have two speakers today. First will be Margaret Conkey, the class of 1960 Professor Emerita of Anthropology. Meg has taught at Berkeley since 1987. Her research includes survey and excavation of upper Paleolithic sites in the French Midi Pyrenees. And her scholarship includes, among many other topics, pioneering collaborative work on archeology span and the study of gender. She has served the Berkeley campus in multiple capacities as well as major professional societies. She brings a wealth of learning about her topic today, the career of Frances Perkins. Several times she has taught a UC Berkeley sophomore seminar on Perkins, who like Meg is a Mount Holyoke College alumna. Catherine Fisk is our second speaker. And she is the Barbara Nachtrieve Armstrong professor at the School of Law. She teaches classes on labor and employment law, civil procedure, and the legal profession. She has authored monographs on the history of employment negotiations over ownership and attribution of creative work, as well as textbooks on labor law and legal profession. Her current work explores the exclusion of self-employed workers and domestic and farm workers from the protection of the New Deal labor and social welfare legislation. A fourth generation Californian, Catherine is the third generation in her family to have earned a degree at UC Berkeley. Okay. So let's start uh, and have a wonderful, wonderful session this afternoon. Thank you, Eleanor. I'm going to go first and move right along here. I'm going to search, but this was man, one of the many different aspects of her identity that she crafted, so to speak, and found enormous um, strength and power in the ritual of the Episcopalian Church, although she was raised as a Congregationalist. Um, as I mentioned, I got involved in this both because I read uh, the book that I use in the sophomore seminar here, the Christian Downey a biography, and also because my family has been going to this place in Maine, Newcastle, Damariscotta area, uh, since the late 1940s. And so suddenly I had a geographic uh, connection to, to Perkins, where she found so much strength and um, sort of sustenance from her paternal grandmother's home um, here in, in Newcastle. And her phrase from uh, Cynthia Perkins was, Whenever a door is opened uh, to you, you've got to go through it. You've got to do it. And I think Francis was mobilized um, by that. Perkins was born in 1880 in Boston, but the family moved to Worcester, Mass. Sure, Francis was not her original name. She changed it as part of her ongoing crafting of self. Uh, she was originally named Fanny Coralie Perkins, uh, attended Mount Holyoke, and, and I think probably several really important facts facets of her life at Mount Holyoke uh, were the uh, exposure she got through a course in sociology and economics to the factories in the Holyoke area where she actually saw firsthand uh, children and women and others in terrible working conditions. <clears throat> and this was a time at which she started to begin to become a different person than she was in a slightly uh, constrained household situation. She and her mother were not the best of friends. Um, but anyway, she certainly moved on. Two other things at Mount Holyoke really sort of impacted her. One was the uh, coming of Mary Woolley as the president in 1901, 
where she actually said, my goodness, you don't have to get married in order to have a satisfying life. And that sort of struck a resonant chord with Frances, even though she did uh, eventually marry. And then the second one was really, really important was a visit to the campus in 1902 from uh, Florence Kelly, who was a well-known social welfare worker and actually was an out and out admitted socialist, which was kind of a radical thing to be at the time. But over the years, she and Francis interacted in, in many different ways and contexts and became an uh, outstanding mentor, friend and guide. So these were some really key things that helped form, if you will, uh, who Francis was. Her following kinds of um, part of her her life, and as I say, this formation uh, was something that the students in the class were always very interested in um, and that we, we sort of stressed, tried to put together the pieces of, of what came to be a person well-suited, well-qualified, and very successful as the first woman secretary uh, in a ca presidential cabinet as she was uh, serving as secretary of labor for um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, starting with his very first of his four terms. Of course, getting out of the house and getting out of home was her uh, one key way. And she again ended up in a very serendipitous situation in Chicago where she went to. Not only was she tech, took a teaching job, which, which she could do, uh, but it was at a very Victorian, very gender stereotypic kind of place. But at the other end of the spectrum, she got involved with the Hull House and Jane Addams. Uh, and many of you know the stories of these important settlement houses uh, dealing with uh, the poor, uh, those who were um, in different uh, unfortunate circumstances. And uh, this, this was really exciting for her. And here was the time in Chicago where she changed, started changing aspects of her identity, changed her name, changed her faith, her religion, and um, she eventually even tried to change her birth date to appear a couple years older. <laughs> um, I'm not going to talk about any of these other experiences, but these are the kinds of things that built towards her uh, becoming who she was um, in terms of spending some time in Philadelphia, uh, doing things a woman of her social class would never do, which was to visit brothels because she was very involved in trying to um, make it uh, safe and make sure there wasn't uh, so much, if you will, sex trafficking going on and women getting um, sort of put into these um, situations of prostitution. Continued her education, uh, going to New York, we got involved with the New York Consumers League, but she was also very active um, in the suffrage activity um, of the early part of the uh, 1910, moving towards 1920. Probably the other really, really impactful event, as everybody who knows anything about Perkins knows, was the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire in March of, 20, uh, March of 1911. This was a horrific event, and Francis witnessed it firsthand, uh, coming out from a, a meeting and a gathering with some other friends, and just watching all of these women, mostly Jewish and Italian immigrant women who had done this work in these extraordinarily packed, uh, unsafe circumstances with locked doors so nobody would leave. Well, you couldn't get out in a fire and all of the fabrics all over the floor that just fed the fire. Uh, really a horrific experience. And I'm sure that if nothing else had convinced Frances she needed to do something about safe working conditions for everybody, uh, it was this, this actually watching this happen as people leapt to their deaths because they had no choice unless they wanted to be burnt up. So, I mean, just a horrific experience that really understandably impacted her. In 1913, she did marry a very active, dynamic um, man involved in politics in uh, New York City, Paul Wilson. Um, but this unfortunately did not turn out to be the uh, most ideal of marriages, um, both because, uh, mostly because Paul himself experienced um, mental health problems, what we might call bipolar today, and was actually institutionalized for most of his adult life after the first years of their marriage. Uh, she did have one daughter, um, Susanna Wilson uh, Kagashal, who um, uh, was born in 19, 1916. And, um, it, and I guess I, at best, her relationship with Francis was rather fraught. And towards the end of Susanna's own life, she also experienced many of the same kinds of mental challenges that her father, uh, Paul, had 
Susanna did have one son, Tomlin, who has been living at and um, helping in the uh, establishment and the transformation of the grandmother home um, in, in Newcastle, Maine, into the, um, a national landmark and now a, uh, the home of the Francis Perkins uh, Center. And um, it will be a wonderful place of education and uh, all sorts of activities related to the legacy of uh, Frances Perkins and everything that that involves. Her second major sort of formation period came when she was involved in New York State politics on the New York State Industrial Commission. It became the, um, especially the becoming the industrial commissioner for the state of New York in 1928, which meant that she actually overlapped exactly at the time with the uh, governorship of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He was at first a state senator and he was the governor of New York before becoming the president and the pre presidential um, president elect and then the president of the United States uh, when he took office in um, 1933. And so Francis and, and he had already developed quite a relationship of respect and trust and uh, ability to work together. They had known each other uh, for four years working together for four years, but had known each other for about 20 plus years. So the fact that, that he could call on her uh, to be the Secretary of Labor uh, came out of a, a longstanding uh, relationship, as I say, of respect and trust. Now, one of the things, the big story about all of this is that when Roosevelt wanted her to become the Labor Secretary, she sort of anticipated this and came to the meeting with a little piece of paper folded up and it had on it her nine demands. And these were the list of what she wanted. He wanted Roosevelt to back her in her attempts to get these kinds of things passed and done. The 40 hour work week, minimum wage, all of these uh, things that everybody today seems to take for granted uh, were certainly not part of life. Not that they hadn't been debated and not that they hadn't been um, attempted in many of the different individual states in the United States. She didn't invent these things. These were issues. And as we'll hear uh, when we hear about Barbara Armstrong, the kinds of things that people like Armstrong were very involved in researching and understanding and promoting as well. So this was not a, a list of Francis's new ideas about what needed to happen. These were things that were being developed, experimented with, researched, and discussed. And she, these were things that she just wanted Roosevelt to have her, uh, um, wanted him to support her in her attempts to get some of these things happening, even if some of them were already uh, a challenge. For example, uh, some of them clearly smacked of socialism, which back then as now, uh, seemed to have put a lot of people off. He also wanted a balanced budget and, and people were really worried about having direct federal aid for unemployment relief and how that would impact the budget. And of course, Roosevelt was very uh, insistent on the fact that any kind of plans for social security were not uh, something that were handouts, that these were more a form of social insurance rather than as he said, Francis, I do not want the dole. So these were the kinds of things that she really advocated for, had written on a little list. And of course, as we can see, uh, I did a great job on that, which have been worked and reworked over the years, with all the, the exception of the last one, health insurance, which we're still really still struggling with. So here we have Frances, the only woman in the room, the only woman in the photo. Um, and you can see the official photo um, of the signing of the Social Security Act in August of 1935. It clearly took several years. Um, Roosevelt had all sorts of issues to deal with right away when he took office, given the economic disaster that the country was in at the time, uh, following on the uh, um, crash of the stock market in 1929 and uh, everything that, that followed in, in terms of the uh, number of people in red lines, out of work, uh, just really a horrific socioeconomic situation uh, inherited. So the question that my students always ask is how did she do it? How did she come up with these demands? And how did she deal with the sex and gender discrimination of the time? Being the first woman in a secretary uh, position in a cabinet in and of itself was a challenge. So she had all these experiences she really crafted her network, she crafted her identity, and she knew, she was knew that she wanted to be in social work. She actually felt increasingly 
summoned or called. This was a calling for her in a religious and really just a spiritual um, sort of way. And on the other hand, she was a strategic person. Some of the kinds of things that she did to get some of these things done are really quite amazing. And, um, you know, she would do things like at one point when she was advising in New York State, um, and uh, many of the senators uh, in the state left before the vote, she actually called the captain of the ferry and told him to not let anybody get on the boat and leave. They had to turn around and come back and vote. So she really had quite a number of, of strategies. And as I say, put herself in situations that her parents would have been horrified at, but that were certainly not part of her social class. A couple of her strategies, um, for being the only woman in the room or the only woman in the photo is that she definitely adopted early on a very maternal world, a role. Uh, her wearing that hat or some hats all the time uh, was part of a decisive strategy on her part to be more of a mother to her colleague, male colleagues than to be an available peer uh, in any kind of sexual or friendship sort of way. So she actually looked older and more dowdy um, uh, and this was a, an explicit sort of structure on her part. Secondly, for example, when she was with the cabinet uh, and there were social gatherings, she went with the women. She went with the wives rather than with the men. Not only did she not like cigars, but she also found that um, the women actually had a lot of things to say about their husbands, which were very helpful to her in dealing with them. Um, and of course, the other thing that we can see over the course of her years of experience, she was, she developed what she called allies as needed. Um, and so she was perfectly willing to work with what some people have described, even venal politicians, such as some of those in the very uh, notorious Tammany Hall period of politics in New York City. Uh, if it could get her done, get done what she thought needed to be done. And she developed these allies as needed. And also lastly, what she often did was used a go-between for her ideas to get from one man to another, rather than presenting the ideas herself. She wasn't interested in taking credit for the ideas. She was interested in getting the idea done. So she did what she needed to do. And um, that was one of her uh, many, uh, many strategies. There are many topics you could pursue, other things that she did. She was instrumental in um, immigration of uh, Germans just as the World War II was starting, as well as in um, keeping deportation of them uh, that many people felt uh, was needed to be done. She was involved with politics. They tried to impeach her. Uh, she was involved with a communist specter and so on and so forth. And then of course, subsequent to the decease of um, uh, Roosevelt in 1945. Uh, she certainly had several more decades of activity and work, as well as a wonderful relationship with a group of young men who lived at Cornell when she was associated there. And of course, the question that still always remains is why isn't she recognized for what she did? And why do we always hear of it as just being FDR's New Deal? Uh, but and not seeing recognition of her. Even today, I often read stories about the New Deal and there's no Francis there, but there's always FDR. So for in the end, I think in terms of this being a presentation about uh, 150 years of women at Berkeley and a uh, women's faculty club, I think her quote in the following year, that the door might not be open to a woman again for a long, long time. And I kind of had a duty to other women to walk in and sit down on the chair that was offered and to establish the right of others, long hence and far distant in geography, to sit in the high seats uh, to prepare that. So um, with that, I'll just say there's much one can learn. Um, there are many books that we can learn about. Um, this one book by the current columnist David Brooks on the road to character, he selected Francis Perkins as one of his subjects to profile and I give a copy of this book to all of the students who take my sophomore seminars so they can actually think about what it means to develop a character, strong moral fiber and character. And I also think that the um, combined event that was put on in the fall of 2018 is really worth taking a look at here at Berkeley Women in the Spirit of the New Deal between the Living New Deal uh, here at Berkeley and the Francis Perkins Center among <clears throat> other sponsors. 
Uh, there's lots of resources and I won't go into them now. And, um, but you know, if anybody wants to know anything more about um, books, uh, there are plenty of them. Websites, especially the, <clears throat> the two I've mentioned today. And my students would uh, do, did an evaluation of films and they certainly say that the recent PBS one on Summoned, Francis Perkins and uh, General Welfare uh, is, is actually an excellent one. So thanks everybody for your attention and I will stop sharing my screen and leave it to Catherine to give us some more wonderful details. Excellent. Thank you very much, Meg. That was fascinating. So now I'll share my screen to talk about Barbara Nottrieb Armstrong. Um, um, so Barbara Nottrieb Armstrong was Berkeley's first woman law professor. Um, she was the first and for many years, the only one indeed at the law school at Berkeley for 40 years, she was the only woman professor. Um, she was uh, born in San Francisco. She attended the Extraordinary Lowell High School, which you might've read about in the news lately. Um, she got all of her degrees from Cal, um, most in economics, but she also got a law degree from the class of 1915. So she really spent most of her life at Berkeley. Um, she was um, a great teacher. And one of the reasons I think why she was regarded as a great teacher is that she was a popular actress when she was in college. Here she is shown on the right, um, acting in a Shakespeare play uh, on the stage of the Greek theater. Um, and uh, actually this, but the quote that I'm showing you is about a different performance, apparently a truly mediocre production of Robin Hood, where the reviewer um, had a lot of bad things to say about the play, but only good things to say about um, Barbara Nochtrieb's talent as an actress performing in it. She was um, known, of course, for her pioneering work on social insurance. Um, she uh, began studying the problems of the economic analysis of poverty, injury, old old age, death of a family breadwinner, um, single parents. When she was in college, when she was an undergraduate at Cal, um, she studied with one of the very first women faculty, Professor Jessica Blanche Pichotto in the Department of Social Economy. Um, Pichotto became Berkeley's first female full professor in 1918. Her field was in part social economics, what we would today call the economics of social welfare. Um, and Armstrong became fascinated with those problems. Um, as the quote on the screen says, this is taken from Armstrong's social uh, oral history. Um, she had very strong views about everything, as we'll see, but she particularly had strong views about how there could be desperate poverty in a country of plenty. Um, in the period of time before workers' compensation laws were adopted in 1913, uh, the rates of injury and occupational illness were extremely high. And if a worker were injured on the job, there was no tort liability against the employer or the coworker who caused the injury, but also no compensation for the worker who had lost their only source of income or for the family. And Armstrong considered this an outrage. Um, she had the same list of problems that she thought should be addressed in a system of social insurance that Francis Perkins did, workers' compensation to cover the risk of occupational injury or illness, social health insurance for any other injury or illness that a worker might, or that a person might experience, pensions for older people or for those who became disabled from work, um, 
survivor's insurance to support the family of a dead breadwinner, uh, unemployment insurance, either for the short term or for the longer term from people who lost their jobs, um, and economic support for single parents, which were often at the time called mother's pensions. Um, when Armstrong was a junior faculty member at Berkeley in the 1920s, she took a year and went to Europe, began studying European social insurance systems, which were more advanced at the time than the US systems were. Based on that, she wrote an enormously influential book called Insuring the Essentials, in which she developed of the economic and sociological analysis as well as the legal analysis that would support a comprehensive system of economic support for people. It would include, of course, a minimum wage. It would include the social insurance that I've described. And she called this a living wage program. That is what people needed in order to survive. Um, and as we'll see one way or another, either in the New Deal or thereafter, most of her ideas were adopted. But I wanna talk about her work during the New Deal. In June of 1934, when unemployment reached levels never before seen in the United States, President Roosevelt created the Committee on Economic Security and named his labor secretary, Francis Perkins, as the chair. The charge to the committee was to study the problems relating to the economic security of individuals and to make recommendations to ameliorate them. Um, the Assistant Solicitor General, a man named Thomas Elliott, sent a telegram to Armstrong saying that the president wanted her to come to Washington to work as a consultant to the committee because her book was the best known and most comprehensive and rigorous analysis of the problems. At the time, uh, Barbara Armstrong received the telegram. She said she didn't actually take it seriously. She said, because I was a woman to begin with, and I was in the West, and there were plenty of people in the East who could have been employed. Um, but nevertheless, a friend who happened to be visiting her at her cabin in Lake Tahoe saw her throw the telegram in the trash and said, you should take that seriously. That's not a joke, which is what Armstrong thought it was. That's for real. And so Armstrong went and interviewed for the position arranged a leave from Berkeley for the fall semester of 1934 and got on the train headed to Washington DC in June of 34 to begin work on the Committee for Economic Security. And then followed an epic battle over the design of the legislation that became the Social Security Act. There is a story and I thought it was true until I started looking into it, that Armstrong and Perkins were allies or friends in advocating for the Social Security Act because their ideas overlapped so much. Um, Armstrong, however, remembered otherwise. In the period between July and December of 1934, when she was in Washington, she said, in all that time, not only did Perkins never see me, but she refused to see me. Time and again, I tried to see her. And when the person who was taking Armstrong's oral history asked why, and so weren't you in agreement? Armstrong said, no, she was fighting our program. She was not helping it and she did not want it. This is sort of trademark Armstrong being quite tart. The reason why is that Perkins and Armstrong were locked in a policy fight about the design of the Social Security Act. And it focused on two principal issues. One was whether the system should be a uniform national system or a combined federal state system. Armstrong won that fight about old age insurance. She lost that fight about unemployment insurance. Um, 
Armstrong wound up creating the program that is today what we call Social Security. It's a nationwide program in which eligibility and benefits do not depend on state law or the extent to which states are willing to tax business to fund the program. Armstrong lost the fight about the design of unemployment insurance. Um, at the time, Perkins favored a joint federal state system of the sort that was, that had just been adopted in Wisconsin. Armstrong had a very dim view of this. She thought that the benefits would not be adequate because she thought that states would not be willing to tax at the level necessary to fund adequate benefits. And she also worried a great deal about workers who moved from state to state, about state excluding whole categories of workers. And one of the things that we discovered during the economic crisis caused by the pandemic in April of 2020 is that Armstrong was right. State unemployment insurance offices struggled under the crush of cases. Benefits in many states were woefully inadequate. Um, the low benefits that had been funded by low taxes did not ameliorate poverty. There was a real concern, you may remember, um, last spring that the country would spiral into a depression like that of the 1930s and it would be long-standing as it was in the 1930s. Uh, so Congress finally stepped in, as you may know, and enacted federal legislation that provided much more generous benefits than states were willing to provide and provided benefits for workers who were excluded from the Social Security Act, especially those who are self-employed or today are independent contractors. But there was one place that Armstrong and Perkins did agree, and that was that domestic workers and farm workers should be covered by social insurance. Armstrong, who could be very critical of Perkins said, she gave Perkins a tremendous amount of credit for insisting to Roosevelt, who was not a leader in policy development and was not uh, as courageous in pushing for this legislation as either Perkins or Armstrong thought he should have been. Armstrong remembered Perkins saying, I am sick and tired and fed up with always leaving out the domestic and the agricultural workers. And I insist that so far as I am concerned, I will not approve a bill in which they aren't placed. If Congress takes it out, well, all right, I can't help it, but I will not say that they shouldn't be included. A leader of the Committee of Economic Security pushed back against this position, according to Armstrong saying, we feel for the domestics and the farm laborers, some of us, just as much as you do, but we were asked to give you technical advice and we cannot advise that it's wise. Armstrong recalled Perkins then saying, well, I'm going to do it. And then Armstrong thought, I thought, well, good for you. I guess you do get fed up by always seeing the people who so much need something, never getting it. Uh, domestic and agricultural workers were, however, excluded from the Social Security Act um, in part because they were, of course, overwhelmingly black, especially in the South, and Roosevelt believed, believed that he needed to get the votes of racist white Southern senators in order to get the legislation through Congress. There's a long story about disputing exactly why um, domestic and farm workers were excluded, but that's one story. The story of Armstrong and social insurance though continues much later and throughout her career. But first I wanna talk a little bit about her career at Berkeley. As I've said, she became a professor at Berkeley. She began teaching in 1919, became an instructor in social economics uh, in 1922, then an assistant professor uh, in both economics and law in 25, was promoted to an associate professor with tenure in 1929. 
Um, she then went off, as I said, in 1934 to Washington, worked on the Social Security Act, came back. And when she came back, she was promoted to full professor. I'll say a little bit more about that later when I talk about her fight for women's equality at Berkeley. In 1954, she became the Morrison Professor of Municipal Law. The AF and Métis Morrison uh, chair still exists in the law school. But in 1954, she was the first woman to hold a named professorship at any law school in the country. So she was a trailblazer throughout. Armstrong's work on social insurance continued after the Social Security Act, and it started before. In particular, she did not live to see the success of one of the things that she fought for. Uh, as Meg mentioned, uh, both she and Perkins shared a belief that health insurance was an essential aspect of the social insurance system. They didn't get it in the Social Security Act, um, but Armstrong spent her career fighting for it. She began actually uh, when she was appointed by the governor of California to be the executive secretary and director of surveys of the California Social Insurance Commission, a position she held for three years. The legislature enacted legislation that would have provided for universal health insurance in California, but it had to be put to the voters through a referendum and it failed. Um, Armstrong describes um, how that happened. She said there was a triumvirate composed of the Christian scientists, the doctors and the insurance people, natural enemies, all of them of each other. And yet they joined hands and they pooled their resource resources and they went to it in what she called a no holds barred effort to prevent the adoption of universal health insurance. Armstrong describes that at one point when she was speaking at a public in event in favor of the ballot referendum, an opponent accused her publicly of embezzling money at the state uh, from the state. As it happened, Armstrong's brother, who she described as a big guy over six feet tall, happened to be there to hear her speak and they were gonna go get dinner afterwards. Um, and when he heard his sister being falsely accused of a crime, he marched up the aisle to uh, punch out the false accuser, but Armstrong stood between them uh, to stop the fight. Um, after the Social Security Act was enacted, Armstrong continued studying what it would take to create universal health insurance. In particular, she went back to Europe and studied how European countries with universal health insurance made it work and wrote a book called The Health Insurance Doctor, which she thought um, would demonstrate that the practice of medicine was actually better under universal health insurance rather than worse. She fought for many pieces of legislation in the California legislature. Um, it came most close to being enacted in the late 40s at a time when Earl Warren was the governor of the state and he enlisted her to work on legislation. She describes a number of incidents in which after the first more ambitious piece of legislation failed, Warren said, well, try again and scale it back a little bit. And so they scaled it back a little bit and uh, it failed again. And then he said, all right, you need, you need to really scale it back. And she said, well, uh, Earl, if that's what you want, you've got the wrong person to draft this statute. And she refused. Um, it failed a third time. But even up to when she retired, she formally retired in the early 60s, she was still fighting for health insurance uh, on a universal basis. Um, another issue where Armstrong was way out ahead of the times was on the issue of rent control. Here against a, sky, a photograph of the skyline of San Francisco in 1942, uh, it points out that during the war, Armstrong uh, took an unpaid leave from Berkeley and went to work for the US Office of Price Administration, um, administering a rent control 
measure in the city of San Francisco uh, and fought very hard for effective control on rents in the city, which were of course skyrocketing because of the influx of population to support all the shipbuilding and industrial production, as well as the fleet that went in and out of the port of San Francisco and the port of Oakland. And she was praised for the effectiveness. In fact, she was so effective in, uh, enforcing limits on rent. She was pushed out of the position and sort of kicked upstairs to being uh, where she could do less harm in that way. And in a sense, that's the history of Barbara Armstrong's life. Um, she was a tireless advocate for the issues she believed in. And one of them was women's equality. And uh, she fought very hard, for example, for pay equity. When she was promoted to be a full professor, she was paid less than 80% of the lowest faculty salary that had been approved by the law faculty for a full professor in 1921. So she was way underpaid for virtually her entire career at the law school. Um, when she went to meetings with colleagues at the faculty club, um, she could not enter the meeting room without being carried across the part of the great hall where women were prohibited to walk. Um, so not surprisingly, she and other women faculty helped found the women's faculty club so that they would not be forced to endure that kind of humiliation. And also they could have equal access to facilities. As I've said, she became the first woman to be uh, told an endowed chair at American Law School. Uh, she was the only woman on the faculty for 40 years. And before she retired uh, at about the age of 70 in 1960, she insisted that the law faculty hire a woman to replace her as it turned out. And she was pretty sure that it, they would only ever have one woman. That woman turned out to be Herma Hill Kay, although, uh, the faculty then did hire another woman, Babette Barton, and the two of them were the only women on the faculty for years and years and years. Um, when Herma was um, recognized for her enormous accomplishments as a law professor, she was uh, Armstrong's protege, uh, alumni of the law school raised money for the Barbara Nachtrieb Armstrong Chair. I was one of the financial contributors. Um, those who organized it envisioned, envisioned it as a way to honor Herma Hill Kay and to um, give Barbara Armstrong the recognition that she had long deserved for her extraordinary contributions to the law, her enormous popularity as a teacher. She was one of the most popular classroom teachers for much of her career, her contributions to California law. She was the author of the leading treatise on California family law and sort of created the modern field. Um, and Herma Hill Kay was the first professor to hold the Barbara Nachtrieb Armstrong Chair in Law. Uh, Herma died in the early summer of 2017, just before I joined the Berkeley faculty. Uh, and the greatest honor of my professional career is that I was then appointed to the Barbara Nachtrieb Armstrong Chair. It's an honor uh, any way you can think about it. Armstrong was the first professor to teach labor law at Berkeley. I am the current professor to teach labor law at Berkeley. And of people who actually really were devoted to the subject, practiced or worked in the area, there was really only one other besides Armstrong and me. Um, our, my father was a professor at Berkeley, uh, sorry, a student at Berkeley and had Armstrong as his, one of his professors and was a huge admirer of her accomplishments. And I remember hearing about it. I never, never dreamed that I would actually teach here or have the chair named after her. Um, but she really paved the way for all of us. And for that, I am very grateful. So thank you.
Let me stop sharing and we can have questions. Thank you so much. I think everybody, I'm gonna turn this on to gallery view so that we can see if people in the audience um, have questions for you. If you don't wanna be re uh, recorded, as I said, just turn off your video feed. But I think that was just such a fascinating um, program from both of you. I know both of them warned me when I asked first about doing this, that this wasn't just a feel good story about two uh, women that got together and did the social security, but the conflict that they had with each other and but what they struggled to do was just amazing. And of course, Barbara was one of the main founders of the club. So that's wonderful. Does anybody have questions at this point for either of our speakers? One thing that we thought about was just, Meg, do you have a question for Catherine at this point? And yeah, I, I just want to uh, say uh, thank you, Catherine. That was really wonderful to get that um, much broader uh, and detailed perspective coming from the Barbara Armstrong side of things, especially the kind of work that she did and how important it was for, <clears throat> as I said, tried to say, uh, that for Frances, <clears throat> You know, it, it, she came up with some ideas for some things, but knew full well that there was a lot of research and scholarship going on. Uh, to read from the Francis Perkins documentation and so forth, um, there are, of course, many sides to the differences of opinion uh, that they had. And uh, our Barbara Armstrong seems to have been a, quite a, a, a strong uh, personality, min minimally. Um, anyway, and somebody said something about her actually being expectedly so because she was redheaded. But anyway, um, uh, but I just wondered um, if in, in looking at Armstrong's work, um, whether she, um, I mean, whether there were other, uh, other scholars or, or how was this kind of work situated within law schools um, more generally at the time? Um, was she, you know, really a pioneer in, um, this kind of research in law, or was it something that was very integral to the the law, law education in the early part of the century? She was a pioneer, um, in part because there was almost no law governing the sort of suite of issues that we call social insurance until workers' comp in the first, the second decade of the 20th century, the Social Security Act in 1935, they were writing on a clean slate. And so the development of this as a field worthy of study is something that she was one of the leaders of. And there were relatively few people nationwide who were doing it. Um, and in part, that's because legal education is often fairly sort of traditional and conservative. And so the many of the subjects that are, were taught then, and some that are still taught now, are teaching law that was 100 years old or sort of legal structure that's that developed long before. And she was really a pioneer in kind of developing the field. Um, at, you know, family law, which was her other major field, she did social insurance, labor law, which was just developing as a field. It had been, there wasn't labor law prior to 1935. Um, family law was this very sort of archaic um, field prior to the mid 20th century when courts were finally prepared to actually enforce legal rights of women, for example, or children. And so in all of these areas, she was really kind of developing something either out of nothing or from a very kind of antiquated, um, you know, in the case of family law, incredibly male dominated system. Yeah, well, I certainly, in what little bit I've, I've read about the, <clears throat> the context within which um, the Social Security Act uh, was formulated. Um, I think what we see are, you know, the 
the often times the sort of two approaches, <clears throat> one, those that comes from those of us who are <clears throat> scholars and educated and researchers and so forth, putting together an ideal package. And then you've got the politics of it on the other side. And then I think a lot of the issues um, <clears throat> that caused a lot of conflict was that of course, as you mentioned, um, Roosevelt and others were always thinking about their voter base and you know, what, what parts of a policy are gonna be acceptable, what parts are not and so forth. So it, it definitely seemed to me that there was a real interesting clash um, at that time <clears throat> between the, what they called the technical people, the ones that came in with the specific ideas or the concepts, and then those that actually had to figure out how they were gonna get this past the, you know, the, the Senate or the House or, or whatever body was per, per keeping it. And so it seems to me that there, and, the, and you know, I think even Francis Perkins would have to admit that the decision to go with a, I mean, even Roosevelt was the one that really wanted it to go with the states because he still felt an allegiance to New York State. And he felt that New York State could actually negotiate a better deal than other states would. And he wanted to save, save that, that kind of thing. So that particular clash, I think, involved Roosevelt as much as it did um, Perkins. But she, of course, had a bazillion other things on her plate. And, um, but anyway, it, it's really, um, I knew that there was a substantial amount of scholarship um, that um, Armstrong had done uh, along these lines. And what we see in many fields is that oftentimes women are pushed into marginal fields, which later become really important. And then the groundwork has actually already been done, but at some considerable expense in status, in terms of, and you mentioned in terms of salary and so forth, uh, where suddenly some of those kinds of issues um, become more mainstream and Guess who's done all the all the groundwork? Anyway, yeah. one of the questions in the chat um, is about Armstrong's personal life, and here I want to connect maybe a little bit about Armstrong's personal life with what you said, Meg, about Perkins's. That is, both of them were, you know struggling with the fact that they didn't always have the support at home, of course, that their male peers did. They were working mothers. Um, Armstrong had one child um, from her first marriage when she was uh, in her early 30s, just starting out her academic career. She then divorced. Um, in fact, she got divorced while she was in Europe. It may be that she went, one of the things that prompted the trip to Europe was because she could get a divorce. So off she went to spend a year studying social insurance in Europe in the early mid twenties as a single mother, bringing her daughter and a nanny so that she could actually do her work. Um, the difference then is that she came back, she remarried, uh, and by all accounts had a very, very happy marriage with her second husband, whose last name was Armstrong. Um, he eventually adopted her daughter when her daughter was a, an adult. Um, he died in the 1950s, quite um, where they were still relatively young. Um, and that was really quite um, heartbreaking for her. Uh, I was asked where she lived um, when she was married. She lived on the north side of campus. And then I believe uh, when her husband died, she moved away to, from that house. I think she wanted a house without the memories. And I believe she lived on the south side. I do know that when she was walking home from campus one night in the late 60s, uh, she was walking down Benvenue and she was mugged and was grievously injured in the mugging and was in a wheelchair and in a great deal of pain for the rest of her life. So, um, but you know, she kept working for as long as she could. Another question from uh, Sheila Humphreys. I see the question in the chat, but Sheila, do you wanna say your question out loud? Oh, I could. I, I, this is, um, I, I think many of us heard Ruth Bader Ginsburg give the first Herma um, K 
Herman Hilke lecture in Zellerbach. And she made a big point of saying, I surely hope that the book that Herma has been working on for a long time um, will soon be published. And I've inquired of the Berkeley Law several times, said coming soon, coming soon, but it looks like it's happened. Here it is, the <laughs> University of California Press. It is in print. And so we can buy it. Yes, you can buy it. And uh, much of what I said about her biography, I crib either from this book, because mm -hmm. I did a tremendous amount of research on Armstrong, or from Armstrong's oral history. Mm -hmm. well, I would just like to add one comment to thank um, Eleanor Swift and you, Catherine, both for um, writing the profiles of um, important women on the law faculty and alumni of Berkeley Law on our on your your page, your 150W page. So thank you very very much. The credit for that goes to Eleanor. Um, yes. I yes. contributed a little bit to the one on Armstrong, mainly borrowing from from the work that Kay did. Eleanor did the rest. Thank you so much, Eleanor. You you took it on. Willingly, we hope. <laughs> well, it's wonderful that you um, were able to do that. I think that <clears throat> certainly the biographers for Frances Perkins have had a harder time. Uh, a lot of materials were never saved. Uh, Frances got rid of some of her materials. And so I think the kind of, um, really a kind of archeological excavation uh, that people have done. And I think Christian Downey, for example, talked to, talked to that, although her book, like many, is really well annotated as to where she got all of her different resources. But, you know, and here we are in an age where <clears throat> all the wonderful things that people are doing are in the internet or, you know, there, there won't be any box of letters to find up in somebody's attic uh, the way some of these researchers have, have been able to do. So I don't know what you're gonna do about it. And of course, um, the 150W project has been all about that as well as what Christina and Paula Fass, Christina Maslach and Paula Fass have doing, been doing with interviewing various people so that we actually don't lo lose all of that. Um, and uh, so I, I'd say that there are gaps in what we know about Frances Perkins because there was not a real good attention paid. She herself wasn't the greatest about saving some of the kinds of things that one, one would want, but that may speak to her modesty as much as to um, her, anything else, but anyway, um, I, I've just been amazed at how much one can find, uh, even though there's not been a conscious uh, effort to, to save things in archives. So bravo to the 150W uh, for advancing that. So thanks Sheila and Christina and Kathy Gallagher and the others who headed that up. Um, yeah. Eleanor, does Bob have any comments since he was one of the uh, people that knew Barbara in person? Well, I could say one thing to add, and that is that Barbara, I knew Barbara because our offices were basically next door to each other in a separate little wing of the law school. And uh, I had lunch and tea with her in her house several times. She came to our house for dinner several times. So I, I knew her uh, pretty well. Uh, but uh, one thing I would add is that she was very, very dedicated in her private life to domestic life. She was, um, she praised her husband, she admired him enormously. Uh, and she was uh, very uh, dedicated to proper domestic behavior. One time when she, this is just a little example, one time when she came to dinner, um, I cleared the plates for uh, dessert and I didn't take the salt and pepper off the table. And she said, you, she reprimanded me for not uh, knowing that you're supposed to take the salt and pepper off the table for dessert. But that's the kind of uh, uh, domestic interest that she had. She was a very, very forceful uh, person and, uh, but very forthcoming and she would uh, come by my office and uh, talk to me for quite a long time about things that were on her mind. Uh, one thing that was always on her mind was her annoyance with one of the leading uh, 
members of the group that wrote the, the Social Security Act. He had a big uh, difference with a guy named Wilbur Cohen, and it may be uh, about the federalism point that Catherine made, I, I don't know. But 30 years later, she was still complaining about it. <laughs> and that, that, but she was, a, it was just a, a, a wonderful, wonderful privilege to know her. She was a wonderful person. Well, I got the impression from the, um, <clears throat> some of the documentation <clears throat> about that, uh, that committee uh, that she was on <clears throat> that, you know, while she carried that grudge against that particular individual, she also um, was not, um, let's see, she, she didn't make a lot of friends be, for saying things like, for example, one of the leaders of this, um, <clears throat> this committee with, with Perkins was a person whose last name was Witt, W-I-T-T-E. And uh, Barbara Armstrong always called him Mr. Halfwit. So she- <laughs> Yeah, so that, that, was, that was part of, you know, her, her kind of, you know, <laughs> out there kind of personality. But I, I think <laughs> it was one of the kinds of things that made for some of the differences of opinion <laughs> that were going on. <laughs> well, hearing, you know, this just makes me think that and she was a, a really a fighter yeah. all the time. And I can see now, uh, listening to her uh, biography, that you know she had to be a fighter to do what she did. She was on the cutting edge of a number of fields, family law as well as social legislation. Right. And uh, she had a terrific self-confidence, I think. And, uh, was a, and her being a fighter uh, helped her achieve all this. It's really quite remarkable when you think about she was a married woman with a child uh, in, uh, in the 20s and 30s when those things were terrific handicaps. Right, yeah, right. Well, of course, Frances Perkins was the same. And, you know, maybe when you get two people that are, you know, necessarily fighters and Perkins' situation was really, really actually quite sad um, with her um, and, and m much of Frances's uh, income and money and so forth went to supporting her husband in an institution. Um, her daughter had a number of different uh, different kinds of careers she liked to pursue, but Frances was absolutely dedicated to trying to uh, support her as well. It meant <clears throat> that for Frances, she had to develop a, an array of different housing relationships um, in in Washington D.C. and um, and lived with some other. Um, very powerful and, and important women, but you know, it was never for sure. So I think she also had a, a life that was filled with uncertainties, both financial as well as personal. And yet, you know, both of them uh, to their, not only to their enormous credit, but to the f luck for all of the rest of us, um, were able to just keep going and have as the, the saying goes from that civil rights hymn, you know, keep their eye on the prize. And uh, I think that's, that's one of the big, big lessons is to uh, seize the opportunities in face of you and to, to do them, not just for yourself, but for a wider, uh, those that come after you, as well as to keep your eyes on the prize of the things that you'd like to accomplish that you will really believe deeply in. So credit to both of them for that. Perkins, her, I believe her husband and her daughter lived in Poughkeepsie, New York for some of the time that Perkins was the Secretary of Labor in Washington, DC. And Perkins would commute back and forth from Poughkeepsie to DC on the weekends. It's it just grueling right. schedule. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, right. And you know, she, even, even with um, the invitation from, or the request from FDR, uh, to, be, to serve as the Secretary of Labor, which in and of itself was a huge thing. It was probably, you know, for most people, you would think, no, that can't be true, like the telegram from uh, FDR to, to Armstrong. Um, she said, well, I, I appreciate your asking me. Here's what I'd like you to back me on. But before I give you my answer, I have to check with my husband. And uh, so went home. And I, I think we have a hard time realizing um, are remembering exactly, uh, despite all of the struggles that many of us here uh, have had personally as well with aspects of discrimination that seems not to go away. Um, uh, but nonetheless, that they were living in a, a, a quite different um, world in terms of expectations of who people could be in the world and what they could do. Um, so I think, you know, that the fact that they were able to manage and 
negotiate those and find ways in which to get things done despite, um, I mean, you know, the, the kinds of, um, of uh, discrimination and, and just, just even sort of just, you know, m marginalizing and uh, minimalizing the contributions that women had at that time were just um, amazing to think that they actually got all, so much, as much done as they did. Do we have any other questions? Yeah, I, I have a question. Uh, sorry for, I'm over my phone, so I hope you can hear me okay. Okay. Uh, this is regarding both of them. I realize that we were focused on the 30s today, but both of them were clearly developing their careers in the 20s as well. I'm wondering if you can say something about the positions or their involvement in the uh, temperance and prohibition in the 20s. Mm -hmm. uh, since uh, both, since the temperance movement had such a strong pro-labor, anti-capital component to them, uh, and both of them were leaning in that direction. I don't. I don't know. I I don't know much about Perkins and that, but I would imagine, given her <clears throat> very strong uh, rootedness in um, uh, her her religion and so forth. I think that she probably, and then given the very pro-labor, she was very pro-labor uh, unions and was very involved in the development of unions, union politicking. In fact, that's what almost got her uh, <clears throat> impeached was her uh, connections with um, Harry Bridges out here in California, um, who was uh, accused of being a communist, which he denied, but I do believe they found out later that he was, <laughs> in fact. <laughs> but <clears throat> um, uh, so I would imagine, but I, I don't think I've read anything about that. And that's something interesting to look into, Avi. So thanks for that, that question. Um, I don't, I don't think she was a, she was strongly um, involved in, in temperance. And the stories that we've heard is that she en enjoyed a good stiff drink herself. So um, I'd be careful about that. She doesn't fit into patterns neatly. Yeah, and I know nothing about Armstrong and <laughs> movements. I, um, I suspect out here the issues were different. I wondered whether part of the reason why Armstrong might have been interested in family law, apart from the fact that it was a stereotypically female kind of issue, was because she herself was divorced in the 1920s, which was quite a radical thing to do. And um, her second husband had also been married before. And so I've often wondered whether that was part of her interest in the field or whether she just wound up as a family law person because she was a woman. I was gonna say at the women's faculty club, there was quite a debate before they ever allowed wine to be served in the dining room. So I don't know if that plays into your question or not, but um, <laughs> it was quite a few years later and uh, hotly debated before it was allowed. Our that is interesting, yeah. I was just thinking about how, though, I, I just happened to be reading up on prohibition recently and realizing that we tend to think of it as being associated with sort of a puritanical streak in uh, the American character and the wasp character in America, but it was really much more of a uh, uh, pro labor, uh, anti exploitation sort of spirit behind uh, stopping. The, uh, the mass bread of hard liquor. I would like to ask um, perhaps if Christina Maslack and Paula Foss would like to say anything about their ongoing projects. Um, we know that this is the end of our um, academic year for academic lives, but we will continue in the fall and some of the programs that we already have discussed include uh, Christina and Paula's work in interviewing those professors that came in the 70s. We're, I've also talked to the School of Social Welfare um, because many of the club's founders were involved with that school 
um, the social economics. So right. um, as you've heard, Armstrong, Pesciuto, Stebbins herself also all worked there. So we're going to follow up on that. And now that Catherine has held up the book on paving the way for women in law, I hope maybe we can have another program from the law school too. Christina? Um, yeah, I just want to say that, um, uh, yeah, hold on, um, that Paul and I have been interviewing women who uh, joined the faculty at Berkeley uh, in the 70s right after the low point of women faculty in the late 60s. And uh, Catherine Gallagher's talk about this that she did you know, some time ago was really about the history of women faculty up to that point. But in the late 60s, for various reasons, uh, the number of women who are on the faculty had dropped quite a bit to like around three, three and a half percent of the faculty, uh, leaving my colleague Susan Irvin Tripp to say that women faculty were about to become extinct. Uh, and there were a number of things that then began to change this, including uh, a lot of attention to the fact that there were so fewer women than one would expect. And the last talk that we had, what was that? Two weeks ago or something like that with, with uh, Rona and Amanda, mm -hmm. they were talking about Susan Irvin Tripp and um, uh, uh, Elizabeth Scott, Betty Scott, uh, and they were the ones who collected the data and publicized it in a way that it really made a big splash and a big issue in, in all kinds of places about what was happening at Berkeley and so few women. So we wanted to capture the experience of women, not just as they were starting their career uh, in very dis different disciplines, but at that time and what was happening at life on the campus, off campus, the rise of all kinds of issues around the women's movement, women's lib, you know, affirmative action, et cetera. Uh, and how did this all, you know, influence or shape the kind of uh, career path that they had when they started out? So we've been uh, doing these interviews and we're going to be depositing a number of them. People have given their permission in the 150W project. Uh, so that'll happen soon. Uh, but we, Paul and I will be analyzing and writing up the kind of themes and the interesting issues that have come up uh, in this. And we hope to, uh, I had five of those women uh, speak at a program at the Women's Faculty Club two years ago. I was trying to remember that. Um, <laughs> so there was five of them there and we'd be happy to do one more or two more with more of these women or just really talking about the kind of things that we'll be writing about. But it's been fascinating to listen to these stories. Uh, and I have to say there is no one stereotype, no one pattern. They, do, they don't fall into a certain kind of uh, a shared experience. Very, very different. Uh, but we hope to be able to share that with you sometime in the fall. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. If I could add something on a slightly different uh, trajectory, but something that I think I'm going to actually ask Sarah uh, Peskin about from the per point of view of the Francis Perkins Center. Uh, one of the things that I was able to incorporate into my last sophomore seminar, given the current social and political um, climate of the past year, uh, was the, re the relationships between um, Francis Perkins and many in her um, office as Secretary of Labor and um, our African American Black um, colleagues. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> there was a very interesting book that we read from in the class um, on the Black Cabinet, which was this uh, book written by Julie, by Jill Watts that just came out this year about basically a, a self appointed uh, cabinet of African American Black people, uh, politicians, especially being led by Mary McLeod Bethune. Um, who Francis had worked um, with a, a, to a certain extent in the way in which Bethune was in charge of the National Youth Administration, trying to put young people uh, into programs like the uh, Public Works Association, the CCC, and so forth. So I just wondered whether there's any discussion or anything. The, the title of the book, um, uh, Sheila asks, it's called The Black Cabinet. And uh, the author is Jill Watts, uh, W-A-T-T-S, and it was just recently published. 
I have a copy. I'm happy to lend it to you, Sheila. Uh, but um, it's a great big fat book, but it's very, very interesting. And again, uh, one of those kinds of dimensions to what was going on at the time. And given that, you know, Catherine mentioned um, how Roosevelt was trying to placate his Southern Democrats um, and so forth, that some of the politics were definitely, you know, uh, those, if, if we accept the notion of race, but certainly we're notions of constructed race um, at the time. So is, is there anything at the, going on at the Perkins Center that has taken up any of this? It, it, it's something we're certainly thinking about and, and aware of, because again, it's another example where Perkins herself was in a very different place than maybe the rest of the administration. Um, you, you probably heard or read about the, the, the story that she was still telling um, in the 1960s to JFK. There's a, there's a, a wonderful photograph where she's holding her, her hands up and, 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 and explaining that that was the size of the cockroaches in the desks. Um, in her office the day she moved in, not her own personal office, but of all the, the staff. And she, as a good social worker, asked questions about why that was so and learned that the, um, the black employees were restricted from eating in the cafeteria of the Department of Labor. And she said, this will end today. Um, and that became the, the case in, in other, um, in other um, uh, federal offices also. But she was the first one, as far as I understood. Um, and yet she's also criticized, as is Armstrong, for the, um, the omission in the Social Security Act for domestic and farm laborers, which was clearly a, 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 a compromise, as you correctly said, to, to get the, the, the Southern vote. So um, it, again, it, there, there's so much more to be learned about this period and these people. And we're very interested and we have a couple of articles. Um, there's one, I, I think it's on our website or I can send you the citation that, that talks in more depth about it. But um, we wish that we could answer more questions as well. It's, it's obviously um, a continuing issue and something of great interest. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Well, I do recommend the Black, the Black Cabinet. It's really quite mm -hmm. a fascinating revelatory uh, book yeah. about um, things that were going on. And, um, you know, certainly uh, the stories of uh, Bethune, um, our, our Mary McLeod Bethune, who's, I guess the historically black college, Bethune Cook is named after her. Mm. Um, anyway, um, just another whole dimension that, that there's no, we can't shut the books, can't shut the door on uh, continuing to pursue these kinds of things, so. Well, thank you so much to Meg and Catherine and also Sheila Humphreys and Christina Gillis. I, if Tina hadn't inspired this Academic Lives program years ago for the club, we wouldn't be here. And Sheila, with your work on 150 women, it's been tremendous. We look forward to welcoming you all back in the fall. As I say, there are so many more programs to be done. So we had tentatively kind of titled this Women of Vision, and um, I think that's, that's just very appropriate. And for all of you that are doing research now, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. We do want to remind you, we have on our website for Women's Faculty Club, we have now posted the last Academic Lives program. Um, if you go to our website, and I can send this out to people, then under Club Events, Academic Lives, you can click on it. We will try to get this one posted as soon as possible. And uh, Christina Maslack reminded me about some other videos we have from previous events. So we will try to be getting those up. We look forward to welcoming you all back in the fall. We hope in person, but um, Zoom has its benefits too, as having Sarah present with us today so richly illustrates. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Okay. Thank you so much. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to go ahead and end, and we'll see you again. Thank you very much. Thank you.